Here we go. When you saw me walk out just now, did you notice that my shoelaces were untied? I'd be willing to bet that if I hadn't tied them, you would have spent my entire talk wanting to say, hey, Tara, check your shoelaces. Isn't that interesting, though, that if we see someone with untied shoes, even if we don't know them, we have this urge to bring it to their attention? Why do you think we do that? I think it's because we know what might happen if they don't tie them. They might trip and fall, and we all have an inherent desire to help them, to prevent them from getting hurt. Or maybe we don't see their untied shoelaces, but we do see someone trip and fall. That same inherent desire to help draws us towards them, to ask if they're okay and extend a helping hand. And maybe once we help them get back up on their feet, we look down and we notice, hey, your shoelaces were untied. Best to check that next time. It's easy to help protect someone's physical well-being because the falls and injuries are visible. But what if we can't see someone is falling or is at risk of doing so? That's the case of mental well-being. When those falls and injuries happen underneath the surface, it's not so easy to say, hey, check your shoelaces, or to pick someone up after they've fallen. But if we were able to see what happens underneath the surface, walking through a university campus would be chaos. Nearly half of all of the students that we'd pass would be walking around with untied shoes, constantly at risk of taking little tumbles that accumulate to great falls, because nearly half of all university students develop at least one mental health disorder during their education. But it's not as if you walk through the doors of your chosen university on the first day of class and bam, you trip and fall and suddenly have debilitating anxiety. So how does it happen? How does nearly half of all post-secondary students come to graduate in an unwell mental state? Well, I've been a university student for seven years now. Hopefully, I'm getting out soon. And so I've had a long time to think about that question. And in order to find its answer, I had to ask myself, well, how did it happen to me? When I started university at 17 years old, I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I had always been a really good student and, I'll admit it, a bit of a nerd. I was always at the top of my class, and I made sure to never miss one. I was that student, sitting in the front row of every course, taking color-coded notes until my wrist ached, and the only relief I gave it was when I'd raise my hand to ask a question, which, to the annoyance of my fellow students and sometimes my professors, was often. I was also active in student organizations. I was passionate about connecting with people, about creating a sense of community and providing students with the help they need to succeed. So I decided to represent my fellow first-year class. And in order to represent them, I had to get to know them. We had lots of conversations, so I knew most of my classmates by name, and they knew mine. But my mental health started to fall during my second year of studies. The first sign was when my grades started to drop. I'd always been at the top of my class, but as the year progressed, each returned assignment was scored lower and lower. I wasn't at the top of my class anymore. And then my participation started to wane. You'd always find me in the front row, taking my color-coded notes and asking lots of questions. But as my courses continued, I wasn't sitting in the front row anymore. I asked fewer questions, and I took no notes. My wrist sure felt better, <laughs> but I didn't. And then I wasn't as socially active as I once was. Those students I had come to know by name became strangers to me, and I to them. I used to wave and say hi to everyone I recognized on campus, but not anymore. Well, 
a few lower grades and sitting a bit further back in class, those behaviors don't really seem like much. But underneath the surface, I was falling. I was constantly taking little tumbles, mentally at least. And when left unaided, all of those little tumbles were left to accumulate into great falls. They became a pattern, a downwards trend, which was exactly the direction my mental health was going. After five years of falling, I graduated with panic disorder, depression, and post-traumatic stress. I wasn't so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed anymore. So how did it happen? How did I become a part of the 50% of students who graduate with not just a degree in hand, but also a mental health disorder, or three? Because it all happened underneath the surface, and what was visible didn't seem to warrant help. No one knew I needed a helping hand, and so all of those little stumbles accumulated into great falls. That was my undergraduate experience, the first five of my seven years in university. And you might hear that, and you might think, you really went back for another two years? <laughs> well, after I graduated, I finally stopped falling, and when I did, it took a bit of time, but I got back up on my feet. But then I learned that what I had experienced was actually considered normal. It was expected that students experience higher than tolerable levels of psychological distress during their education. And that, to me, was a big problem. Being a part of that statistic, I wanted to find a solution. So I decided to go back for another two years to get a master's in learning, education, and technology. And in learning about all three, I did find a solution. And it all started with untied shoelaces. I was out for my mid-afternoon walk one sunny afternoon during my first year of studies when I saw an approaching neighbor trip and fall. This caught my awareness, and so I rushed to close the distance between us to ask her if she was okay and extend a helping hand. Thankfully, she was fine. But when I helped her get back up on her feet, I looked down and I noticed her shoelaces were untied so I brought it to her attention. She tied them up, we exchanged smiles, and we carried on our respective afternoon walks. When I continued on mine, though, the most absurd question popped into my head. How do we know to extend a helping hand to someone after they've tripped over their shoelaces? It seems silly because it's almost common sense, right? But if you think about it, how do we know when to help someone? I came to the equally absurd answer, because we know what walking looks like. We all know that walking means staying upright and putting one foot in front of the other. That means that we form a prediction that when someone walks past us, the normal outcome is that they're going to keep staying upright and putting one foot in front of the other. If they trip and fall, our prediction was wrong and an abnormal outcome occurred instead. And that's what sparks our awareness that a helping hand might be needed. A helping hand is dependent on the awareness that it's necessary, but that awareness is dependent on an abnormal outcome. I transposed that answer onto my undergraduate experience. And if you didn't know my average grades, see how much I participated in class, or know that I was a social and communicative person, then you wouldn't know that falling grades, asking no questions, and growing quiet were my falls, my abnormal outcomes, because you didn't know what my normal looked like as a student to begin with. Not unless you knew me well enough because what we really mean when we say we know someone is that we know they're normal. And so I realized that in order to find a solution, we need to get back to getting to know students, to learn each of their respective normals. That way, if abnormal outcomes occur, 
they can be recognized for the warning signs they are that something else might be going on underneath the surface. Something that can raise our awareness that this student might be at risk of falling, and so we should extend a helping hand. We all have that inherent desire to help, but sometimes we need help in knowing when and who to offer it to. But the process of getting to know someone is a lengthy one. And if post-secondary populations are in the tens of thousands, that's a near impossibility with face-to-face -face interactions. But I'd be willing to bet, my second bet of the day, that if you check the screen time on your phone right now, it would say you've spent more time interacting with your digital devices than with people today. You see, whether we're interacting with our phone or another person, the same process is taking place behind the scenes. The gathering of information, predicting your behaviors, getting to know you, it's just that our devices are infinitely better at it because they're designed that way. They're designed to replace repeatable processes like predicting our behaviors, and to do it much faster than we can. Whereas we use social skills from our interactions, our devices use machine learning from digital footprints. From all of the data we leave behind, our devices are programmed to trace our path like footprints in the sand, or I guess in Oulu, footprints in the snow. From connecting those footprints, our devices see a digitized path. They learn where we've been, where we are, and can accurately predict where we're going. Our devices also notify us if we're headed for a fall to try to get us back on track. Like when your fitness watch tells you to go for your daily walk to get your steps in. We can leverage those same technologies we already use to protect our physical well-being, to protect our mental well-being, too. But to be leaving digital footprints, I need to be using digital devices. Now, this idea wasn't fully possible during my undergraduate education because my learning wasn't dependent enough upon technology. But the biggest difference between my undergrad and my master's is that in the last two years, I've spent more time interacting with my computer than with my classmates. And that's all thanks to COVID-19. When the pandemic started and lockdowns ensued, schools around the world had to close their doors. And when students couldn't attend physical classrooms anymore, we had to move to online learning. Physical classrooms became virtual learning environments. And so long as I have access to a digital device, I can learn from anywhere. And if I'm using digital devices, then I'm leaving those digital footprints. Because of the pandemic, physical classrooms became virtual learning environments. And in that process, because I'm using a device to access my education, all of my data as a student can be gathered, stored, and analyzed on those platforms. Let's use my undergrad as an example. I participated lots in class and asked lots of questions. I got to know my students, my classmates, sorry, really well, and we had lots of conversations. That was my normal, in person, at least. But when moving to online learning, my normal behavior as a student doesn't change, it just looks a little different. Participating in class looks like turning on my camera during a video lecture, unmuting my microphone to engage in discussions, and clicking on the raise my hand feature to ask a question. Getting to know my classmates looks like scheduling video calls to study together, participating in group chats and reacting to posts with emojis. Each of these interactions with my virtual learning environment leaves a digital footprint. And with all of this data, most of which can't be captured in a physical classroom, we can use those same technologies we already use to get to know someone, to get to know each student's respective normal, to compare where they've been with where they're going and detect if they're headed for a fall. If they are, those same technologies can then be used to raise that critical awareness. First to the student as a means of saying, 
your shoelaces are untied. And to those in the university best fit to help as a means of saying, this student might be at risk of falling and so you should reach out your hand. Due to the pandemic, we've seen the highest growth rate of educational technologies we have ever seen. And university education is the most digitized it has ever been. This is where our opportunity lies to find lasting solutions to problems that have plagued post-secondary institutions for decades, including the student mental health crisis. We can weave a digital safety net that protects the psychological well-being of all students by turning digital footprints into helping hands, by allowing technology to take care of the processes so that we can get back to taking care of people, so that maybe 50% of post-secondary students won't develop a mental health disorder during their education. But turning those digital footprints into helping hands starts with remembering our inherent desire to help and allowing technology to lend us a helping hand in the process. Thank you. <laughs>